We're going to see a story uh, today, as I've already mentioned in the Old Testament, where uh, in the middle of the chaos of life, in the middle of the storm of Israel becoming a nation, with all the rebellion and disobedience, the blood and the guts and the gore, the selfishness, the Bible says more than once that that time during the time of Judges, people did what was right in their own eyes. They sold out for 10 bucks. They betrayed one another. And they didn't care. They would get a parking ticket, but they would never admit to it, even in front of friends. They would steal. They disobeyed and they sinned horribly. In the middle of all of that is a, this amazing love story of Ruth and a man by the name of Boaz. Now, the way we're going to look at this story today is uh, there are four chapters in the book of Ruth. Ruth is one of two books in the Bible uh, named after a woman. Uh, who can name the other book? Esther. Very good. Uh, we're going to get to her here a little bit later. I think Esther is in June sometime. Um, it is only four chapters and 85 total verses. It tells an amazing story of redemption. What was broken has been repaired. What was lost has been found. What was dead has been raised to life. And what was chaos is now peace. We'll see that because it reflects what God is actually doing. And I, what, I hope it is what he has done, is doing, and will do in your life. That he takes you from separated and lost and dead in sin and raises you to life, adopts you, grafts you in. You're his. Sin doesn't make you bad. Sin makes you dead. It's not about being good enough. God does not grade on a curve. It's about being perfect, Jesus said. We've gone through this already in the, in the story. The Ten Commandments were given, not that they were a measurement that if we meet enough of them, enough of the time, that we somehow make it in. No, they are given to us to show us the predicament in which we find ourselves. I can't keep this one. I don't keep this one. In fact, all of us have broken all of them. And so there is a need for all of us spiritually. And that's the story of redemption of which we are reading. So we're going to do this today in four easy steps. There are four chapters and we're going to take one chapter and one concept or word each chapter, tie it together in a bow at the end, I hope. Okay? If you want to follow along, I'm reading, and I'll be reading selections of it from the New International Version. If you're reading a different version, it might sound a little bit different, but the basic story is going to be the same. Uh, the book of Ruth, uh, one of the things this is actually, the story is helping me do, I used to know, but I've forgotten, but I'm learning the, the books of the Bible in order again. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. That's where we are. Okay? First and second Samuel, first and second Chronicles. They're coming up in the next couple of weeks. Okay? So let's take this journey in four easy steps about doing the right thing. Okay? First of all, it is four C's we're going to concentrate on. Chapter one is the conversion of Ruth. So, Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled. Remember, we've talked about that. Okay? There was no king. They really weren't a nation. But they were being formed into that. They were clans, family groups. They've crossed over the Jordan River into the promised land. God has given it to them. They must possess it. And one of the things is they have to push out the other enemies of God. They have to push out the other groups that rejected Yahweh God, that practiced, that worshiped other gods. The, many of them were uh, child sacrifice type religions. 
And God could not stand that. And so this place he had made for them, he was going to give to them, but they had to push these other groups out. That's where they are. They've divided up the land by tribes. There's two million, probably, uh, Israelites, Hebrews, Israelites, Jews, interactive, slightly different, but basically the same thing. And they're in this generations-long process of making their society into a nation, okay? In the middle of the chaos, Ruth appears, and it says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, so they're in Canaan, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. So they left Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread. They left the house of bread because there was no bread. It was the famine. But where they went, instead of trusting God, they went to one of these pagan cultures, Moab. The Moabites lived there. How many people know where they came from? Lot, I believe, had relations with a daughter, which had a son named Moab. That's, that's where they, and they have been, they worshiped a God called Chemosh, I think is his name, which was a child sacrifice God. And that was abhorrent, it was evil, and they were one of the groups they were to push out. But instead, Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons, Kilion and Malon, they went there. Now, maybe it was pragmatic. Maybe it was just the logistics of there's food there. There was a certain element of providing for my family. They can eat and survive and live. But the guy who's leading Naomi and his two sons, um, Elimelech, Elimelech means my God is king. And yet, he didn't trust his God enough to provide for him. And so he left and went in the direction of the pagans. Well, they didn't, as you know, they didn't, they, they were there for a while, I think 10 years, but it really wasn't life because Elimelech died, making Naomi a widow. And the two boys had married, Kilion and Malon had married Ruth and um, Orpah. Well, then the two boys died. So now there are three widows in that culture. That meant poverty. If you didn't have someone to come in and help you. If you didn't have a family member, it was part of the culture. If a young woman was widowed, a, a younger man still in the family part of their life, if that man died without having had children with his wife, their, their cultural law said that that man's brother can come in, marry her, have children with her, thereby keeping the family name alive, keeping the family going rather than a woman dying, never marrying again. And so it was, it was a thing that there it was a survival thing. And we'll see some, a, a, a variation of that in a little bit. Naomi, the mother-in-law, hears that now Bethlehem has bread. And she says, let's go back. We get to verse, I think it's seven, when the, to her two daughters-in-law, with her two daughters-in-law, she left that place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So all three of them packed up and they're headed. But she must have had second thoughts because she began, as Mark told you, began to talk them into, hey, I've, I've had second thoughts about this. You guys are leaving your families, your culture, everything known to you to go to Canaan where everything is unknown to you and you are heathen, you're Gentiles, you're non-believers, You'll never find a husband over here. You stay with your people. You're young enough that you can remarry and still have children and your lives will be fine. I'm too old, so I'm going to go back. Well, as you know, Orpah took that advice and she went back, but Ruth did not. And so we're going to see as they come to this place, where Ruth expresses her loyalty, as Mark described. In verse 16, but Ruth replied, 
Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where I go, excuse me, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord, and it's Hebrew translated Yehovah, May Jehovah deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you from me. Something happened to Ruth. Why did she love her mother-in-law that much? You know, if, um, if my, while my parents were still living, if my dad had died and I had died, And my mom said to Jill, well, as you know, I grew up in Roberta, Georgia. I have family there. I'm going to go back there. There is something about Ruth that the Bible says she loved, loved her. But maybe there's more that we don't know. And one of the things that it could, she could have been abused in her family. And she wasn't going back to that. Maybe she was afraid of people or, the, or what was behind her. Something motivated her to turn toward Yahweh, to turn toward the house of bread, to turn toward Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land, with her mother-in-law Naomi. And so she says, I'm, I'm with you. Where you go, I go. Where you live, I'm going to live. And then she says, your God will be my God. And so I'm taking this. This is a conversion. God is at work here. It's not just logistics about bread and eating and surviving. And maybe God has been working on her since her husband's death. Since, you know, no telling how long. But God is at work here in a bigger picture And in chapter 1, we see Ruth converted to faith. What was it like when you left your people, your old life, and you decided to turn toward Yahweh, the God of creation, that I'm forever committed, I'm going to be forever loyal some of us have had, some of you have had this verse in your wedding as part of your wedding vows. And if you zoom back out, the Bible describes our faith. Jesus is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And we say to him, where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, your Father, Heavenly Father Jesus, will now be my Heavenly Father. And where you die on this earth, you went before me in, into death, I will too, but I'll, I will, I'm following you. A conversion. Chapter 2. The conversation. Lots of the Bible is written in first person. It's just describing. It's a description. So-and-so went here. He said this. This is what happened. They went there. This is what happened. All that stuff. This book, there's a lot of conversation. A lot of quotations. He said, she said, he said, said, she said. All that. You'll you'll see it. If you have a a Bible that you can highlight on paper with a highlighter or colored pencils, or if you have an online Bible that you can highlight, go through it and Uh, whatever uh, Ruth says, highlight in pink. Pink is for girls. Whatever Boaz says, highlight in blue. Blue is for boys. And you'll see this conversation that they have. It's rather interesting, obviously. Um, Naomi's still in the story, but Ruth says to her mother-in-law, okay, we're here, but we're hungry. There's no 7-Eleven down at the corner. Even if there was, they didn't have money for it. Okay, she says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Okay, so it was harvest time. 
they were by hand manually harvesting wheat or barley. And then poor people, it was a part of the Jewish law that, you know, it was their culture. They would, whatever would fall, if you cut down uh, a stalks of wheat or barley and some of it fell, you don't pick it up. You leave it for the poor. That was the thing. So she wants to go and glean. Okay, so she asked her mother, can I do this, mother-in-law? And she says, go ahead, my daughter, verse 2. And then she says in verse 3, so she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. The next phrase is important. As it turned out, by coincidence, as a matter of fact, it just so happened she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So it's family. She didn't know it. It was just kind of by chance. Eh, no. God is at work in a bigger picture here. Okay? So that was, all, that was all in God's divine purpose. Just then, coincidentally, at, the, at that moment, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem. And greeted the harvesters, the Lord be with you. His harvesters replied, the Lord bless you. And then Boaz asked his overseer, the foreman, who's that girl? That girl there, who is that? She comes over. She realizes she has been noticed. She realizes they are talking about me. And she is strong enough in herself. She comes over and says, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind your harvesters. She came into the field that morning as, and remained there, uh, except for a short time of rest. So she's asking permission. So Boaz told Ruth, my daughter. Okay, now that's a term of endearment, but it's also a term of respect. It wasn't, he, he, he used a term. He just didn't answer the question. My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in any other field. And don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And where, whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. He's providing for her and he's protecting her. So there's a very... Um, a very positive initial meeting. Well, they have more conversation. I found favor in your eyes. Um, come over here and have some bread. We get down to uh, toward the end uh, of the day. She goes home, verse 19, her mother-in-law asks, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Uh, then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man was Boaz. Ding, 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 ding. And Naomi's mind. The Lord bless him. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Okay, or your version might say kinsman redeemer. He's our next of kin. Okay, they didn't have social security. They didn't have life insurance. Okay, so if you were a woman and your husband died and you didn't have sons to take care of you, a, another generation behind you to take care of you, you were destitute. Unless some of your family would step in. And that was determined by who was the next of kin, just like it is in our society. If, you know, if you're in the hospital and you can't make your own decisions medically, the staff is going to ask, well, who is the next of kin? It will be a spouse. She didn't have a spouse. It will be children. She didn't have any children. Okay? She had daughters-in-law. The next of kin would do that, and they would come in and take you into their home and care for you. It also was a legal thing about property. Naomi did not inherit um. Um, what's his name? Elia, not Eleazar. Elimelech. She did not I inherit that because it didn't go sideways to a spouse. It went down to sons only. Well, 
there were no sons. So it was all at risk of losing the family farm, let's say. Okay? But a kinsman redeemer could not only care for the family, redeem the family, they would redeem the property. They would buy it. And thereby that, that family farm would stay within the family. That's what, what the Israelites did. I mean, it made a lot of sense. And it's still basically a lot of those things. Judeo-Christian law, Western law is based on the Ten Commandments. It's based on a lot of these things. So, in this passage, they have this long conversation where she realizes who Boaz is. He's a kinsman redeemer, and it all happened by chance. No, God is at work here. Chapter 3. The conduct. So, conversion, conversation, conduct. 3, verse 1. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you. Or, I must find a man for you. At this point is where the music starts. What am I going to sing? Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find me a find, catch me a catch. That's what Naomi is up to. We got to find a guy for this girl. So she, uh, now Boaz, do you remember Boaz? Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. So you wash, take a shower, put on perfume, get dressed in your best, Princey's hottest clothes, okay? Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know that you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. So they would work all day. When the sun goes down, they can't work any longer. Then they would eat, drink, rest, talk, prepare. And then they would all sleep on the threshing floor, all the men, till the next day. Because when the sun came, as soon as the sun came up, you're back at it again. So she says, you go down there. Don't bother him while he's, till he's done and when he's done eating. Okay, don't interrupt. But then notice the place where he goes to lay down. Then go over and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I bet he will. It sounds a little sketch, but it's not. Okay? This is all very proper. Okay? I will do whatever you say, she said. So she goes. She approaches quietly. It's dark. Things are quieted down. The meal's over. The other guys are bedding down over here on this side. Boaz is over here by himself. He's the owner. He's the landowner. And she lays down at his feet, takes the cover, puts it over her. He's startled by this. Who are you? He asked. She replied, I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer in our family. Now that's important when she says, cover me or spread the corner of your cloak uh, to cover me. We'll come back to that word. But what's happening here is she's approaching him in a proper way. And what that really means in their culture is you're the kinsman redeemer. You're the person. May I marry you? Will you take me in as your wife? It was not unusual. It sounds odd to us, but it wasn't unusual to them. And in fact, she lay at his feet because she lay perpendicular with him. Okay? She laid a cross uh, at the bottom of his feet, and it looked like this. Had she had other intentions, she would have snuggled in beside him in a parallel position, and that would have communicated a completely different message. So she just quietly lays at his feet. He's startled. Who, who's here? Who's here? Who are you? 
Then he remembers who it is when she says, I'm your servant, and would you cover me with the corner of your cloak or your blanket? So he understood what that meant, okay? The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men, whether they were rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. If you go to Proverbs 31, that same word appears. A wife of noble character. Who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. And Boaz understood this. So not only was, you know, there was a conversion in Ruth's life. There was a lot of conversation to get where they are now. Okay? Now they, it's their conduct. They were doing things right. In the right order. Following what was right in the word in their culture. They did the right thing. Now, they may have been tempted, but her reputation preceded her. He'd watched her in the field. He knew about her following Naomi when she could have stayed in her own homeland. She came to care for Naomi, her aging mother-in-law. So he kind of, he Facebook creeped her. He knew kind of what she was about, what she was up to. He already, she already knew about him. This is described as a man of standing. He's a kinsman redeemer, she finds out, by, by chance. All of this is working, but it is their conduct that's now on display. I'm your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you're the kinsman redeemer. And he replies, yes, I will do what you ask, because I already know you are a woman of noble character. Well, they sleep there on the threshing floor. She gets up before the light and heads out so no one would see her. It's not that they did anything wrong. It's he was trying to protect her from the gossipers because the gossipers don't care about the facts. They just want to tell a story, whether it's true or not. Nothing's changed in 3,700 years. Um, and so she leaves before the sun comes up and her reputation is, is still intact. Nobody did anything wrong, but who knows what people will say. She gets to her mother-in-law's house. She gets back home. And what do you think Naomi does? How did it go, sweetie? That's exactly what she asked in verse 16. She told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, hey, he gave me these six measures of barley for you. So not only is he doing things right with Ruth, he's handling the parents too, the parent too. He, he's feeding her too, providing for her too. Their conduct is now on display. They did the right thing, all of them. It's an amazing love story. Now, we're getting to the last chapter. We have seen Ruth's conversion, the, a lot of the conversation, setting all this up, understanding it all, their conduct reflected about doing things right, okay? And now we are at the conception. We get to chapter 4, and the scene changes. They are now at the town gate, okay? So they're not at the threshing floor out in the fields. They're back at the town gate. This would have been like, almost like a courthouse setting, there would have been a notary public. There would have been the elders of the community that make the decision. Whoever the judge was would have gone there to hear cases of people. This guy did this wrong to me. What should we do? It was a public area. And just so happens, coincidentally, as Boaz is there, the first in line kinsman redeemer happens to walk by he had told her there was somebody in front of her uh, excuse me in front of him and if that other person who is a closer relative if he wanted to redeem i don't have any choice but i will do it if he doesn't 
Well, it just so happens they're at the town gate, right where they should be, in a public place, and here comes dude. First place. He's first on the depth chart. He says to this guy, come over here, my friend, and sit down. Now, Imagine being in downtown Centralia over by the police station where maybe the city hall is. A lot of illegal stuff happens there. Notary public's there. All that stuff. And somebody says to you during Anchor Fest, hey, come over here and sit down. The first thing is like, who? Who are you? Dude, get lost. Everybody knows Boaz's reputation. He is a man of standing. Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Aren't there people who, if they would have said that to you, hey, you got a minute? Come over here and sit down a minute. You would do it. People of respect. People you trust. That was Boaz. He had done things right his whole life. And it was public in his community. So he went over and sat down. Boaz then took 10 of the elders of the town and said, sit here. Guess what they did? They sat down. And he tells this story. Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling a piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy this in the presence of these witnesses. Uh, If you will redeem it, then do so. But if not... Uh, please tell me so I will know, for, I, uh, for no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. So he's explaining this. This is, this is Naomi. This is Ruth. Elimelech died. You're first in line. You're the redeemer. Do you want to do this? The guy says, I will redeem it. And if Naomi and Ruth were there, they went like this. But Boaz wasn't done. On the day you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of his family on the property. So it's a package deal. Yeah, you get the land. That's the legal part of it. But there was a social contract too. You're also agreeing to take in Ruth, the younger one, as your wife, and Naomi which would be kind of like your mother-in-law, you're going to support your Social Security now and Medicare. You're going to take care of them. Well, that's a different deal. The guardian redeemer said, whoop, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it. I cannot. And basically, if he had children of his own, And now this other family comes along that he's a kinsman redeemer at his death. Then there would have been confusion on who gets what. And he did not want to jeopardize his own family line, his own property, his own children. He thought, nah, too much for me. Too much risk. I'm out. Then Boaz said, "Um, uh, by yourself. And he tells Boaz, buy it yourself. So he does. Today are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, and Malon. I've also acquired Ruth, the Moabite, Malon's widow, as my wife in order to maintain the name uh, on his property so that uh, it will not disappear from among the family or his hometown. Today you are witnesses. And they make it all legal. They do it all above board. It's all just right they did the right thing so now we get down to 13 so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife notice the order of things that they're doing him in a certain order okay she became his wife when he made love to her the Lord enabled her to conceive God Yahweh the Lord appears very few times in this story. When we get to Esther, how many times does the word Yahweh, God, the Lord, appear in Esther? Does anybody know? Zero. Zero. And yet it's an amazing testimony of God's sovereignty. We don't have to be in church singing worship hymns. 
for God to be working in our hearts. Even in the mundane things of life. Okay? So, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Now here come all the women, Naomi and her friends. Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you, Naomi, without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given birth. Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. Her friends said, Naomi has a son. Well, Naomi really didn't have a son. But remember where they are. They're in Bethlehem. The others, Ruth was a Moabite woman. It's hard to kind of crack into this new culture. They've been friends with her her whole life. Ah, Naomi has a son. Grandson, technically. But her family has been saved. Her family has been redeemed. And they named him Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David. If you click over, you're going to see a bigger picture. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 1. We've read the story of Ruth, her individual walk, her individual conversion, her individual conduct, conversations, and her individual conception of and she bore a son. It was all her life. But there's more going on. There is the story of Israel going on here. In, a, in the above story, in the bigger story, God is at work not just in Ruth and Boaz's marriage or their family or their life. God is at work in the entire nation of Israel. All of this fits into his plan. And in fact, what we're going to see here in a second is it fits to the entire redemption of all mankind. This is a part of that. If we go to uh, Matthew chapter 1, you'll see there the genealogy of Jesus. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah. And we go down the line. We get to uh, verse 3 through 6, I think. uh, 7, 6. There are four women mentioned. Very unusual for a genealogy, historical genealogy, In that time period. Okay, just didn't happen. It was always the men. Okay. Judah was the father of Perez. And Zerah, whose mother, was Tamar. There's woman number one. She pretended to be a prostitute. It's kind of of weird how that all went down. Perez was the father of uh, Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Abinadab. Abinadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of... Solomon, we're on the men's side now. Oh, excuse me, Salmon, sorry, not Solomon, we're not here, we're not there yet. Salmon, Salmon was the father of Boaz, that's Boaz's dad, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz's mother was the prostitute Rahab, that's woman number two. Boaz was the father of Obed, we just saw that. Whose mother was Ruth? Woman number three. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. It goes down 14 generations. Keep going. And we get to about 15. Eliud was the father of Eleazar. We don't know these people. Eleazar was the father of Mathan. Mathan was the father of Jacob. There's 10,000 Jacobs in the Bible. Kind of like John in our culture. Lots of them. And Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus. What's the point of all that? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse. 
He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Ruth. She was a Gentile. And yet she is in the family line of Jesus. Through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Here's the point. We have all been excluded, separated, widowed, if you will, destitute, desperate, no hope. And then just by chance, as a matter of fact, coincidentally, Things happened in your life that have brought you to this room hearing this message today. And just like the story of Ruth, you being in this room and you hearing that Jesus is our Redeemer. He redeems us. He takes us as his own at somewhat of a cost. But he loves us enough. Just like God was working in Boaz and Ruth and all of their history, all of that genealogy, it is not an accident that you are here today. So as we close today, I want to challenge you. There is a story that is being played out that is bigger than just my salvation, February 27th, 1977, at about five minutes till 12 on a Sunday morning. That's my individual little circle. But look what God has done in my life with my wife and my kids. And, and Lord knows, when Gary Stowers asked me to come out to this place, into that church 30-some years ago, I thought he was crazy. I mean, he is, but I thought he was really crazy. It's like, are you kidding? Nobody's going to come to church out here. I didn't ever vocalize any of that. Look what God has done. I now have had the privilege to, to baptize children of people that I've baptized. Look what God has done. Five years ago tonight, all that was left was ashes. Now, church building doesn't mean anything. You're the church. We're the church. But it's symbolic. God is at work. And you have heard today the story of Jesus being the Redeemer. He has stepped in and done everything just right. We see it in Boaz. Now, was Boaz perfect? No, he wasn't. Boaz, it, doesn't, it didn't talk about it in, this, in the story, but he wasn't perfect. He was a man. But in Christ, we can do the right thing. And just as Connor said, when we betray Jesus, He still loves us. He's still our kinsman redeemer. He is still the bridegroom and we are still the bride. When your husband or wife messes up, when they betray, disown, are they still your husband? Are they still your wife? Think about growing up. When you disappointed your parents, when you were the prodigal that ran off, were you still your father's child? Yeah. So you've heard today a redeemer that wants you. And it is a part of a grand story. But it's also a whisper in the story of just your heart. What are you going to do with this kinsman redeemer? 
What are you going to do with this Jesus who became a curse so we could be the blessing of Jesus? God made him who knew no sin. That's Jesus. Not Boaz, not Joseph, not David. God made him who knew no sin. There's only one person. Made him to be sin. He became sin, as Connor described. He took all of that. Dallas talked about it. Took all of that. So that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So as we close today, just like Boaz, just like Ruth, and I suppose with a little bit of a mother-in-law phrasing and tense, even Naomi, who did the right thing. Will you do the right thing? Would you give your life if you never have, or would you give it day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour, to follow your kinsman redeemer who loves you? It's a grand story. Don't miss it. Let's pray. Father God, we're grateful this day. There's a lot in this story, in this history, in this love song of people. And we thank you that you put it in the middle of all of this mess of Israel becoming a nation to remind us of your beauty and your grace. When everything else in our life seems to be falling apart, torn down, burned down, remind us that your grace is in the middle the kinsman redeemer steps forward and calls us his own. And you alone make beauty from ashes. Thank you that you love us so. It's not because of who we are, what we do. You love us because of who you are. We're grateful. Help us as we live this life, day by day with each other, with people around us, maybe with a total stranger. Help us to hear your voice. We want to be sheep that know the shepherd's voice. That we might do the right thing. Because you've certainly done the right thing for us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.